So, um, we're only human after all. The people side of digital transformation and connecting with the audience. Everybody know what all this is about? Well, we've got three experts who are gonna tell us all about that. So I'd first of all like to introduce uh, Adrian. So tell us a little bit. Hi, I'm um, Adrian Winkles. I'm the uh, Director of Cybersecurity Research and Cyber Lead for Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. Um, a lot of my job um, is reaching out to professional bodies, industry, um, student groups, uh, developing solutions uh, to problems. Not about doing uh, blue sky research for research sake, but actually finding solutions to practical problems. Excellent. And how are we gonna how are we gonna get better than that, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm Beth and Vincent, I'm the marketing director at NetSales. We're a product and software development consultancy based in York, and we do a lot of digital transformation projects. So that's kind of all coming from, I guess, a more industry-focused uh, uh, point of view, but also I've been on the painful receiving end of digital transformation projects as well, so can speak a bit about personal experience of when perhaps it doesn't go as well as um, it should in uh, a university environment. <laughs> okay. And... Peter, do you know anything about digital transformation? Not a bloody thing. <laughs> um, my name's Peter Donington. And I, I started my career as a rocket scientist. Don't do that anymore. Um, my, I, I've just started my own company, actually, after 40 years of work. What I'm particularly interested in, and what I've developed tools, is teaching computers about human behavior. So why do people do what they do? And in the world of digital transformation, that also enables things about, well, how do we encompass the transformation? What does it mean to people? Do they value it? And what do we as organizations do about that? So I'm a one-man band, and my role is to help organizations like you develop your own capabilities to do it. Excellent. All right. So we've got a number of questions that we asked you, the audience, to provide for this, um, for this session. However, we will be coming out and asking for some questions as we go through. Um, but I guess the first one to start us all off is um, what is the intended benefit of all this digital transformation? And how does it just differ from anything that we did in the past? Isn't it just sort of business evolving? Um, I think ladies first. <laughs> so I guess the Industrial Revolution was a very prolonged period of change. I think that's what people forget. Uh, it was 200 years of mechanisation. I'm a history graduate, so <laughs> got to throw in some history there. But um, really, digital transformation is happening in an extremely short space of time. You know, it's the last five, maybe 10 years, you could argue, but really it's speeding up now. And I suppose um, the majority of kind of clients we work with on these types of projects uh, it's about efficiency for organisations. It, it's often organisations who they're well established in the market, they cannot get more profit out of that market unless they increase market share or they improve efficiency. And this is where we find technology really comes in. But I think drawing on your point, there's got to be a problem it's going to solve. It can't just be about, oh, let's try this new, we, we hear a lot about blockchain, right? Let's try this blockchain solution. <laughs> often it's not solving a problem, and that's, that's the kind of, I think, the friction between di uh, digital transformation and actually people's lived experience. Oh, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I could add on top of that. I tend to find it's understanding what the user requirements are first. You don't do technology for technology's sake. Um, you need a good understanding of what the customer wants. And sometimes you have to tease out the customer what actually what their problem is that you're trying to solve. You don't put a digital solution in just for the sake of it. You don't want to sell them technology just for technology's sake because you're just, you're just going to create problems for the future. Peter, anything, anything yeah. like that? So there, I think there are two important dimensions for this that, that play very much in my world. The good reason. Um, Often businesses say, we want to be digital because that's where our customers are. They're bathed in bits, generation X, Y, Z, A, B, C. You know, they live in the digital realm. They're used to transacting. They type with their thumbs and not with their fingers. Um, so that's where they are. That's where we need to service them. So that's the good reason. The real reason for many organizations is a point that Bethan touched on, touched on cost reduction. 
You know, we want to make things simpler, we want to reduce cost, we think that digital is cheaper than people, so we'll use a digital transformation. Actually, that is a completely legitimate reason to do it, but it does store up some problems which come up later on when you implement and it doesn't quite go to plan. And the benefits you think you're going to get are often not the ones that you actually get. You know. So between the two, I'd say it's important to, for your why, make sure that it's what's important to you and to the people who are going to experience that digital transformation. Because if they don't see the value, in fact, they often push back. But anybody heard the term digital containment? You, know, you lock me in an app, you don't let me get out, I can't do what I want to do, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, the organization might think it's great because it's cheap, but from a customer experience point of view, it's awful. And when you get it wrong, it can be really bad. I'd go one step beyond that. And you think that you've delivered a nice app for the business, but when you look at the apps that you can get out there as a consumer now, you go, oh, that is really crap compared to what's happening here. And therefore, the, the competition out there is actually that customer engagement and customer insight. We've talked a lot, though, <laughs> about people. And, and Adrian said, you know, you don't do technology for technology's sake. So, um, human beings generally don't like change, so how do you persuade users to adopt new systems and silos and, and change that business environment? I'll start with Peter. Okay, so, um, well there's lots of books of change management you can go out there, but there is a few things I've picked up. I, I should say, as a quant-based scientist, I just think, why aren't people logical, do the right thing for the right reason? Um, so there are a couple of things I always say. Firstly, you cannot reason somebody out of a position they weren't reasoned into in the first place. If they're having an emotional, visceral response to something, you cannot just use logic to overcome that. So you need to appeal to them at an emotional level and explain to them what's in it for them. You know, why should they care? Why is this important to them? Don't go along and say, this is good for our business, we make more profit, our shareholders will do better. They want to know how it adjusts their life. And you have to recognize that in the world of digital transformation, particularly if you mention the word bot, what people often hear is job cut. So you have to address that. And you know, making the biz, big business case really doesn't ally that at all. Okay, you have to talk to about what they're concerned about. So that, you know, as you would expect from somebody about behavior, address the behavior, address the underlying attitude. Adrian? I think really following um, that point is the user's got to see the benefits of doing something. I mean, it, there has to be what, are, what tangible benefits that they're going to get out of using this new digital product or this new digital solution. Uh, if the user isn't going to benefit, the org organisation might, but the user's got to see some uh, benefit to their um, way of working or um, more time to do something else, more streamlined. If they don't have that benefit, are they going to engage with a digital solution? And I guess I'm, I'm going to come from the marketeer's point of view, but you make it seem like their idea, like they, they own it, they came up with it. And this is why a big part of, of the start of any digital transformation project has to be that kind of engagement, workshop-based, you know, getting people in a room and really fleshing out those ideas. If they feel part of that process, you can do this for any process, any kind of change management. It doesn't have to be DT, it can be new branding. If you get them in that room and get them bought in, and actually you're buying them in by just having them in the process, the outcome will be so much better because they will feel invested in the best possible outcome of that project because they're part of it. And I would argue that, you know, down to having your customer service agents have representatives. If you can't have all of them in a room, get representatives from every level of all your, all your organization in the room. And do listen to them because actually sometimes they have the most surprising ideas that you think, oh, didn't know that. We can do something about that. And you get that insight. So it sounds as though you've got to be rational and make sure that there's a, a reason. You've got to make sure that you, you touch on people's emotions and how you want to deal with it. And you've got to take some soundings about what's the right thing to do. But where do you start? What's the, f what's the killer question <laughs> that you should be asking before you even start this process? What's the secret sauce? <laughs> Adrian, you, you look as if you're burning to tell us. I think that understanding what the user problem is, 
before you go any further, understand before you go down that digital transformation route, what problems are you trying to solve? We come back to that fundamental route. What it, what benefit are they, is the person going to get from a digital transformation? If you're going to, if I mean you've got the old adage that if it, um, if it ain't broke, uh, sorry, if it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So it, it, um, there's there's still that sort of adage that wins. Um, if it is efficiencies, then say it's efficiencies, but be sure of the reason you're doing it before you start. Otherwise, you're back to the technology for technology's sake. Peter, what's um, your secret gem? Well, there's two, I think, that are important. First question, and we've heard it several times today, is the why. Why do you want to do this? Do you have a really clear vision and purpose for undergoing this transformation project? The second question is, are you ready and committed? Because um, I'm sure we've all experienced in organisations strategy du jour. The board have got a new idea, they're going to run with it, and we just sit there and say, we'll give it a year. They'll move on to the next thing. This will go away. Um, it's human nature to, we quite like things to stay as they are. We're not really all up for let's all do wholesale change, because change tends to feel like risk. And most of us are actually, to a degree, risk averse, apart from the adrenaline junkies. But um, So why? Um, important and are you ready? Because you might have a good reason to do it, but if you're not ready, then you'll just spin your wheels. Yeah, to build on kind of the, the problem thing, and I think it, it, it is really important to think about the problems in the business, what problems are you trying to solve? But thinking about some of the clients we deal with, they are often in the kind of manufacturing industry, you know, in, up in Yorkshire, so it's, it's not behind, but there's a Yorkshire way of doing things. Um, if you're from there, you'll know what I mean. But to go in and say, okay, what problems do you try to solve for tech? They're, they're going to have no concept internally. They don't have the expertise. So it's more about, okay, where are you trying to go as a business? What are your objectives? And take it from there and then distill that back into, okay, if you want to get to there, what are the problems stopping you from getting there? Oh, okay, it's efficiency in this department. Interesting. There could be a technological solution there. So you're getting really that kind of discovery piece across a wide range. You're not just focusing down on kind of, I guess, that bottom layer of like the problems, because you might miss things as well. That's what we tend to find. Lots of businesses have problems they don't even know about. So that's why you do need an external eyes are good. You can do it as an internal exercise as well. But you do need that kind of um, wide, and it is blue sky thinking in a way, but you're not taking action on it. You're using it to inform further decision making. So uh, can I take the deflection one first? Yeah. Um, yeah. I love Dilbert. Anybody follow the Dilbert things? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, there is definitely a mindset that says, we've got a problem over here, but that's too uncomfortable. We don't want to deal with that. Um, we're going to do this instead. And, and I love to hate or hate to love blaming the big four consultancies for emperor's new clothes every two, new year, two years. Something new we all have to go and get because it's the latest watchword. Um, but thankfully, I think we're going through pretty much all of the digital transformation side of that now. Now we're into other things like AI and machine learning and all of this kind of stuff. Um, some of it is actually we don't know what we, we need to do. So w we have a vision that we want to be better, but we don't know where we are. We don't know what better looks like. So how could we possibly know what capabilities we need in order to be better? So it can be a case of just being busy to look like we're doing something and achieving something. But often it's actually misdirected. Um, deflection, actually, in the world of the call centre is quite interesting because it's one of the cases where digital often fails. We want, to digi we want to deflect people from voice into a digital channel because it's cheaper and easier and consistent, and customers actually push back and say, we don't like it. it you, know, you use it all the time, and actually it's great for 90% of the time, but 10% doesn't. So if you know where you want to be, you should be able to derive the capabilities you need to deliver that. And from there, you can work everything backwards. How will we get it? What have we got inside? Um, and I'll let the others deal with the other point that you raised. Yeah, sorry, could you just reiterate? I just thought it was 
human, human nature is yeah. that we have always done things for the sake of yeah. seeing what happens if we do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we've evolved. Yeah. And so I how does that come in when it comes to digital transformation and does it impact on Yeah, it's deaf, so I call it tinkering. Just tinker around the edges, you know, and you play with things. And we, we see this a lot in the kind of software development world with people building MVPs. And I think that that's a great start for organisations to dip their toe into the world of digital instead of building out the final solution, which, you know, it's a 12-month process. You gather your requirements at the start of the 12 months. By the time the bloody thing's built, it probably, the requirements have changed. So this is where agile software development, agile development, and all of that comes into play and just allow some time for people to tinker. I think failure in this country is something we really hate. You know, when you look at the states, it's a badge of honor to have failed if you go out to Silicon Valley, but allow some slack in your organization. You know, even if it's 20%, 10%, just for people to try out stuff that fails. Google do it with their, I think it's 10% time, don't they? And you can do that within a project setting. It just needs to be it needs to be transparent and it needs there needs to be an understanding from leadership that we are going to do some some projects where we don't expect a return but we think they might teach us something but the issue is when that mentality is across a whole project it's like oh we're just going to go build something that shouldn't be the case i mean i still i still know there is there is a place for having new ideas mm -hmm. and for experimenting with those new ideas and then being able to understand how you can apply them to the problems you have. You still, um, you've, you, if, you, if you don't experiment, you don't learn new things, and you don't see where they can be applied. Um, and as long as, you, as long as it is small scale to start with, and you can build it up and you can see where it scales to, then, you can, then you've, you've safeguarded some of the risk if you want to deploy it across a whole organisation. But you have got to take that brave step to think about what those new ideas are and how they might be used. You don't go for a big bang just for a new idea, just for the sake of it. You start with it small and you build it up bit by bit. I think um, <clears throat> one of the things that interests me is that there, there is a, I love this fail, fast, fail, cheap mm -hmm. kind of thing that goes on. The danger is that sometimes we convince ourselves we're doing something really cool and valuable without actually checking in with a customer. So we come up with something we think is great and they're going, yeah, fantastic, but the price point's wrong and it's, yeah. why would you want to do that? But we go, but look how long it took to develop, and it's so cool, and look at all of the algorithms seen behind it. So um, I do love the experimentation thing, but I also think it has to be fairly well grounded in value. Somebody at the end yeah. has to get value out of this. Yeah. And if we take our eye off the value thing, then I go back to academia, and I'll happily do that and ask really complicated questions <laughs> and have really complicated answers, like most of my answers. Um, so keep your eye on value. That will also dictate whether you're going off point. So if you start to migrate to this thing, oh, we're being active for the sake of activity's sake, you say, who benefits? Yeah, isn't that the criminal investigation when you ask the question, who benefits? And I think that's always a question we should always ask ourselves. Who benefits? Tim, following on from that, that element, one thing I've seen is developers on their own will go off at a tangent, and they'll go down the <laughs> shiny, this is fun route. Yeah. And I'm going to squeeze AI in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and put it up your blockchain. Yeah. Um, but one way to ground that, I think, to use your, your word, um, is to have the customer involved in that agile yeah. process and have a sort of a mission squad that actually says, right, I've got a customer and a developer working together to, to mean that what they're developing actually fits the requirement that the customer had in the first place. And if you've got teams that can start building in that way, it kind of pulls the devs back, yeah. back in line. Yeah. And they stop going shiny and they start being useful. Yeah, and that's why, so when, whenever we do this kind of software development process, instead of having kind of the devs off, like you say, mm -hmm. on a tangent doing their thing, they're working within a cross-functional team, so they're working with business analysts, who are very much like, these are the requirements, please stick to these. They're working with the project managers who are like, please don't stick yeah. AI in there. <laughs> like, for the love of God, don't do it unless it's highly relevant. And, and that's, I think software development is moving towards that model generally, but that, again, you could bring in your marketing team, that works really well. You could bring in customer experience and you have this cross-functional element to things. It, it's hard to manage sometimes, but it, the output is so much better. But is this where Agile can provide a real benefit? Because you can say, right, you've got two weeks to go blat, and if it hasn't mm. produced in two weeks, we haven't lost too much. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's that kind of breaking down as well of, of the problem then into feature sets as well. So instead of prioritise, like let's say you want to build an AI component into a project yeah. and you think, like, actually there is some value here, what you would then do is basically rate that against every other feature you want to build and if it's at the bottom of the list, fine, it will get built at some point, but you're not prioritising it above the core functionality that actually the user wants. And that's where Agile and Scrum really, really are powerful. I think there's a, another benefit of bringing together a coalition of stakeholders, whether they're users, employees, mm. um, and that's in vision. And Henry Ford once was quoted as saying, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And Steve Jobs built Apple on this idea of being ahead of the market. So there's definitely a role in co-creation and co-production for people being able to see ways in which perhaps you can service them that nobody had thought about before. Mm -hmm. I, I was employee 23 at Vodafone. We didn't see text coming. You know, that was something engineers did. They, you know, engineers used tech to talk to each other. Consumers got it and said, this is great. I can send little messages on this end. An entire industry spawned out of that. And nobody actually saw that coming. Now, vision is actually a really hard thing to do when you're thinking about creativity. But many organizations are actually quite good at vision and planning. <coughs> what they're not so good at is engaging and exciting people that they care enough about what they're trying to do, and they're rubbish at embedding things and making and sustaining their momentum, making it last forever. But when you do get people bought in, when you do get the users are bought in and they become part of the solution and they're putting features in, and I've seen great examples of co-creation with people like BT going over looking at some of these things, you end up with innovative products which are serving needs that perhaps nobody in a design room had sat down and put on a wall and say we need to do X. Um, if anything, sometimes those retrospective views actually um, hold back the development of new features which have come back. So yeah, bring them in, but also be open to the idea that that insight, that vision could come from anywhere. And a really mature organization has got feelers out there, they're listening to these subtle voices. One of the things, that I look at customer journeys, and actually the people who often know the best about customer journeys are not customers, they're employees. And you ask the employees, they can point and say, we knew that was broken, why didn't you ask us? We could tell you that was broken. And yet you've gone out and surveyed 10,000 customers to find out that it was broken. So create the user problem. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, if, if you, you could, I would say there's a problem or an opportunity. You can couch it in whatever term you like. Focus on the silver lining or the cloud. I really don't mind, but look at the cloud. Can I add something just on that? Um, I review quite a few vendors and products that have been developed and I've come across the fact they've been using Agile, it all looks fantastic, but what you find is there's a, a loss of here's the business problem, here's what we're trying to do for our end customers, here's where we're going, but in that communication process, because everything's moving so fast, the communication doesn't carry through and the clear vision statement of this is why it's going to be important doesn't carry through. Um, one company spent four and a half million and the CEO had a good vision, the marketeer had a good vision, they knew how they were going to take the product to marketplace and as I went through I went, but wait a minute, what you're showing me, the, 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 the screens and how it's working, there's something missing and as I worked through, we brought in the data scientist and the data scientist went, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, it doesn't do that, but that's the Key USP that you're trying to sell to UBS, and, and it just didn't work because that agile process doesn't sometimes it focuses on process rather than what's the outcome that you're expecting. So, you good problem, good technical people, be careful what you ask for if you didn't give them the ecosystem in which it's going on. Um, and I, unfortunately, I haven't seen this once. I've seen it three, four, five, and six. Um, there was another hand that was going to talk. Problem is, even agile kills that innovation process. The tools, the process. Allowing Does agile kill the innovation process? Yeah, yeah. like you, you mentioned, Lou. Is it too still cumbersome and slow to meet an ever changing digital world where business teams need something now, quick? Give them yeah. something that can evolve the process to the point they know. Mm -hmm. 
So there's something called dual track agile, where you would have kind of your more innovation team working on one set of kind of discovery and feature generation, and they're they're decoupled from the the centralized features you've got to deliver to move that platform forward in its current state. And that's one way of doing it. So you're making sure you're always focusing on core delivery because core delivery has to happen. There has to be you know that maintainability and the scalability in there. But then you have your again blue sky thinking happening on the side but it is happening and they are able to feed back in the process. I've seen Agile in other organisations go horrifically wrong. It, it, it can be awful but when done right and it has and it's communication actually is where it always fails but when done right and when you can have those two streams feeding into a product you actually see some massive advances and yet it might take a bit longer for that innovation to feed in because on a different cycle but you're opening yourself up to both. I don't think it has to be innovation versus core functionality. You can have both. Uh, Adrian, any comments? Yeah, I think you can have your cake and eat it. Mm. Excellent. I, uh, I, I think I know where you're coming from. It's like you, I've seen lots of cases where Agile has actually been interpreted as anarchy. <laughs> and the Moscow <laughs> matrix is just used. The features that actually the customer wants are right at the bottom. And the features that the dev devs want and that they're instrumenting are right at the top. And so you confuse UX with CX. You know, so the, uh, the interface and the features become more important than the value. You know, we lose sight of the value, and that is that communication thing. So what's the purpose? What is this designed to serve? You, um, have anybody heard of the customer effort score? Often used in processes. So if you forget the question, it's not like it's a little like the MPS one. It's basically say, how easy was it for you to dot dot dot? Okay. And this is the new metric. A lot of people are using this. It wasn't that long ago. People would camp outside an Apple store for three nights to get the latest version of a phone that they bought a year ago and is only slightly better. Effort isn't the only metric. The metrics of value are often the things that we overlook as engineers and devs. Because we look at functionality and feature sets, and it's easy to take our eye off the value. Users will actually put up with quite a lot of core functionality that just does what they want to. And my analogy is supermarkets. I don't want a relationship with my supermarket. I want to go in, get my stuff, get out. Make it as easy as possible. That's great. Don't need a greeter. Don't need somebody to stuff the bag for me. Um, for me, it's price, convenience, uh, transactional. And one of the challenges is often devs are quite young and they don't have enough life experience and sometimes they don't see that value. It's our job to be comments on us to pass that down and say, this is the purpose, this is the why of what we're doing. But then again, for a supermarket, you might not be the ideal demographic. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move on, let's move on. Um, so how, how to incorporate AI and deep learning solutions into digital transformation programs? AIDL is innovating at breakneck speed. How can a rapid piece of change be adopted and leveraged? Adrian. I think you have to be realistic where AI and machine learning or deep learning is concerned, and you you apply it to small problems. It's not the big encompass. I mean, it's oversold as the over over encompassing answer to everything. But you, machine learning works best on small problems, or small um, achievable problems, if you like. Um, it's identifying the snow leopard, it's I identifying the anomaly in the data, um, it's the ident identifying what's the thing that sticks out as being different from the normal behaviour um, from your users. Those are the things that there, in my experience, are where machine learning works best. Or, if you're looking at something forensically, you'll be able to, you can it helps you search the data for what you're after. So it, it is a big boon in certain circumstances, but it's not everything to everyone. So be realistic what you can do with machine learning. Mm. So a lot of nodding there, Ben. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? So yeah, I guess it goes back to you know, AlphaGo, um, Google's kind of program that obviously played Go and became top ranking, and AlphaGo 2 that beat AlphaGo in faster spe speed of time. It was still playing Go which is a, a game that has many permutations of moves beyond kind of compute, but it's still a game with very set rules. That's why it could play it extremely well. And I think it's this idea of kind of 
open versus closed AI. And I think you, a lot of the models we have that are touted as AI or machine learning that you can go and play with on Google Cloud for free, you can just go and play with it. They're still very code specific problems they can solve. But the thing is, um, I think, again, it's back to those small problems in your business, trying to solve those if you can, but also realizing that sometimes an algorithm is just what you need. You know, you don't need a self-learning solution. An algorithm will do the job, and algorithms have done the job for you know the last 20, 50 years, absolutely fine. And you, it's that over-engineering piece again that people get into where they think, oh yeah, this is what machine learning, you know, AI can solve. And the final thing we see a lot is people just don't have the data for machine learning models. And it, it needs like a vast amount of data to be inputted into it to train the model, to train the algorithm to perform. And people, unless you're a massive bank or you know you have millions upon millions of data points to train on, you, you're not gonna see any benefit because it's just not gonna work. And I think there's, um the expectation of AI. People talk about AI as if generalized artificial intelligence mm. is some amazing robotic system that can handle all kinds of problems. And it's not. The snow leopard is a great example. It will find a snow leopard that a yeti walks across, pays no attention to that, even though that's super interesting. Um, so what I've seen is that AI, people think they're going to end up with one or two big AI models, and they end up with two or three hundred small AI models doing discrete tasks, handing off to each other. The other thing is the role. So um, AI could be a triage bot. It's trying to determine what your intent is so that it can put you through to the right process. But another role is to change the A to augmented intelligence, where the human is in the loop and the AI is supporting the, the, the entity that can do that generalized intelligence. And this is actually how the nature of work will change. Uh, in the contact center world, the jobs where your role is to sit on a seat and answer the phone and press the green button when the customer says buy are disappearing. That can be done with AI. What's left over is complicated, unanticipated, doesn't fit the rule set, is often very human. And that's going to require soft skills, flexibility, creative thinking, not typically what we recruit for in the contact center world. And those people are going to be expensive they're going to take a long time to get to that point. And we, in this section, we talk a lot about um, emotion and empathy and emotive CX because we have not come across an empathic bot at the moment. Not one that actually doesn't drop you into the uncanny valley where you absolutely reject it. If you had an Alexa actually trying to enter into a relationship with you, it's like, no, we're not ready for that. Not for a long time. Um, but there's a lot of a focus on it. So I would say, Look at what the A means in artificial intelligence. Firstly, it's not quite as intelligent as we think, but actually augmentation is a really good one, and adaptation is what we need to be able to reflect back. Alexa is teaching us how to talk to it, not the other way around. <laughs> so uh, if you've ever tried it and you, you put a query to Alexa and you know what works and what doesn't, and I love watching my three-year-old granddaughter trying to have a conversation with Alexa. She just wants, and she knows now, Alexa, play Penny's playlist. And on comes her favorite nursery rhymes. But she tries all these really complicated queries, and you get that, I don't know how to do that, at the back. So Alexa is teaching us how to interface with artificial intelligence. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, actually, just forgetting AI and customer satisfaction before. Uh, more than once, I have them to go on a website and uh, contact, contact customer service, and I end up with a, a bot essentially talking to me, which uh, failed the Turing test, yep. Yep. obviously, uh, which just dragged a big breath of frustration on my because at first I, I thought I was talking to a real human being until that doesn't make sense at all. What, what, what is your thoughts on, on the use of AI regarding interaction with, with most of the time unhappy customers? in the view of believing human in the yeah. background, but will then deal with real complicated issues that are not answered just by FAQ. Yeah, I think it has to be really explicitly a bot. I think the best, the best outcome is where the human agent knows it is dealing with an artificial whatever it is, whether it's just spitting out things back to you or it's actually kind of got some intelligence behind it. 
and people know very, very quickly and feel duped. And it's back to the emotion thing. As soon as they feel duped, it turns into a poor customer experience. But if you're really upfront and you're like, I'm interacting, you know, hey, I'm whatever bot, you can do these things with me. And that's kind of the UX, CX working together to mm. make sure that you're having a good experience and you get what you want out of it. But equally, how many times have you been on a website and you're getting such bizarre stat static responses back? So you type yeah. something in and say, I need this thing. And it says, hi, how are you? I need this <laughs> thing. And, and, you, and you, you say, I don't want to talk to a bot. And they come back and say, no, I'm a real person. I, you know, <laughs> whatever. You think, yeah. <laughs> the, the level of training in those places and the fact that they are uh, rigidly following scripts undermines the fact that they're paying for a human on the end of the thing anyway. Yeah, and, and that's partly driven by cost because those people who are able to do that are typically more expensive, it takes longer to train them. They're in demand from your competitors. So as soon as they figure out you've got employees with EQ, they're going to suck them out of your business and put them into theirs. Um, I absolutely get the point though. This uncanny valley thing is an all or nothing game. Mm -hmm. um, if you cannot come up with something that has artificial behavior that reflects you know, an emotional version of Turing, don't bother. Okay? Be upfront. Just say, I'm a bot, I can help you with this. Do you want to change your password? I'm a bot, I can do that for you. Do you want to talk about how you're going through your grief cycle, through bereavement right now? Let me put you through to a human being. Um, you can, and this is the work that I was interested in, anticipate which mindset a customer is in when they dial in. And there you can be very quick with the bot to triage and say, actually, this customer is going to need to talk to somebody with the EQ to be able to deal with that. But I've had the same experience. Two weeks ago, I had it with my web service provider. I was in a web chat with them, and it, I was so frustrated, and it was a human being, but he was locked into a process he couldn't actually get out of, and neither could I. The business process was impossible to complete. He knew it, and I found out that it was impossible to complete. And it was a really sucky customer experience. Now, can you imagine what I did in the customer satisfaction survey afterwards? And the score I gave on a ranking of zero to ten. Zero! Yes. Because I said, fix this. This is simply broken. But there are, I, I appreciate, and I'm, I try to go up front with people saying, I don't know the answer, but I'll find out for you. And this is actually interesting about asynchronous messaging right now. Because now you get the point where the agent says, I can't give you the, the answer right away, because I'm going to have to go and look this up for you. Can I come back to you in 30 minutes? And that's OK if you're in a WhatsApp kind of conversation. I don't have to keep the browser window open. Tell me when you know. Because we're going to have to face that more. Because as I say, bots will deal with the stuff that's easy. What's left over is going to be complex. And it will require creative problem solving. And on that, how often do you see two questions? How did the person do the result? And how did you find the process? Right? Mm -hmm. You're losing information. You give mm. a, a negative mark, because, and they go back, hey, well, it must be the person that's not dealing with it. We'll give them more training. And that's not the answer. It's the process that's failing. We've got time for one more question. Uh, I think Jeremy has his hand up. I was going to say, um, having made pages of notes throughout the day, if in the next 18 months, what do you think is the single most um, critical problem slash opportunity facing? I personally think we touched on it already and it's talent and um, it, it's, it's empowering workers to do the work that they can do as in the imagination work, the knowledge work instead of kind of the, the grunt work but the premium on the people who do that well is only going to go up and businesses, this is again back to the efficiency, need to look at ways of making all roles efficient to be able to pay those costs for those better people that will drive their business forward. And that, that if anything, look at your employer branding, look at your competitive positioning in terms of pay, benefits and all of that, because that is going to be the thing that's going to make or break you. We're businesses built on people, not on technology. Invest in your people and the good technology will come out of that. Yeah, getting experienced talent, mm. that. It, it's, it's, um, it is, it's just obviously coming from academia. It's, we can churn out uh, graduates, but graduates need experience. So business needs to work with academia to get those experience, those first lines on the CV. Um, it's not just about the qualification, it's about 
how you apply the skills you learn and how you learn those new skills so it's training that next generation as well to be useful to the businesses of the future. I'm going to take a different point of view. Relevance. One of the challenges many of the businesses I work with, and they're commoditized industries, so they all look the same, and they're all using the same low-code environments, and they're all using the same development environments, they all look the same. And there's a lot of noise, and they're desperate to cut through the clutter and become relevant to their customers. And that's where the real battleground is, apart from the talent to do that, is actually, you know, we know advertising is in a really bad place right now. You know, we're trying to target well, but we've got so much noise, and we're tuning it out. So we have to deliver value to our customers. We have to be relevant in their lives, and they're the ones that are deciding, not us. So the conversations I'm having with businesses right now are they're trying to reconnect and be relevant. And they're, sorry for being a marketer, and I've been a marketer as well. <laughs> Every piece of marketing is an interruption in somebody's day, and they need to get some value out of that to in order for you to give you permission to get their message across. If you're not relevant, they'll tune you out. And if you look like everybody else, everything will ultimately end up being a commodity that we surface through comparison websites. And we'll just go with commodity pricing. So is the other message to be different? Be relevant. And different. And different. Um, so you don't have to be di different. You do have to be good, the right level of good. But one of, one of the things I found, and I'm sorry, this will be the last thing. I, I wrote an article called Customer Delight Doesn't Pay. And what I found was, through the data, that once customers like you enough, the other factors take over. Price, convenience, accessibility, all of those kinds of things. But if they don't like you, they don't consider you. Spending more money does not make them more loyal, does not make them spend more money with you. You just have to get to that point. And that was the relevance, inflection point. When we're relevant to customers, they will then take into account other things. You, um, as I don't use barbers a great deal, but... Um, you know, that's a service that a lot of people can deliver, so how do you choose whether you go that way or that way? Um, it's a subjective decision, it's not necessarily an objective one. Uh, if you choose your coffee, coffee is a hot, caffeinated drink. Why on earth do we go out of our way to go to our particular favourite coffee shop? It's subjective, so it's based on relevance. So you're saying invest in marketing? Invest in marketing. <laughs> in, in relevant, relevant marketing. Yeah. Right. 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 And know what your customer wants. Yeah. What they really want, which is not necessarily what they say they yeah. want. We can now draw the line there. It's the end of the conference. I would like you all to thank our panel for being such experts. Um, I think we may be around for another five minutes. Um, I'd like to really thank all of you for actually making it today and, and being here. I think we've had a huge crowd today, um, beyond what we thought under the circumstances. So well done for you for being here. Uh, in your programme, you will find um, future events. Uh, the next one of these, which is targeted at marketeers, security and the IT, is in uh, September this year. Uh, so I no doubt will meet many of you then and see some of you before then. But um, safe journey home, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.